you seen those videos, those review videos of guys who don't even own the car driving it around and trying to explain to you how an i3 feels. <laughs> this is not one of those videos. This video is from someone who's driven the car 60,000 miles over the course of two and a half years. I use this car as my primary vehicle. I drive it everywhere, every day. I drive my kids in the car. There's two car seats in the back. And so this is the real deal. We're gonna talk about a, this is gonna be a comprehensive video about the i3, about the ownership, longevity, and things you need to know as a new owner or someone who is about to buy the car. <laughs> The goal for me is that by the end of this video, you'll have a comprehensive understanding of the car in all aspects. It's not going to go over everything in complete detail because that video would be way too long, but we're going to break it down into three sections. The first section is going to be the motor, the Rex, uh, what drives the gas portion of the car. It's going to be the gas generator and we're also going to be talking about the electric motor. Part two is going to go over the exterior of the car and part three will go into the interior. You know you have the Rex when you have this back portion. The gas goes there and the electricity goes here. 2014 cars will have only this circular part, okay? Because this bottom part means that it has DC charging or level 3 charging, which is the quick charging. You cannot have level 3 at home because all the lights in your neighborhood would go out if that was the case. So when you're at home, you're going to be using level 2 and that's this guy here. Level 1 is also this guy, but level 2 will do it a little bit faster. Again, 2014 cars, this portion or the DC is going to be an option and is not necessarily included. So if you're buying a 2014 car, which I do not recommend under any circumstance, but if you do for some reason, make sure it has this if you plan to be driving and charging on level 3. One thing you may not have noticed is this little hook. So this little hook is for you to hook these cables on so that they're out of the way. All the panels on this car are plastic. So that's good and bad. The good thing is that when it gets knocked over, it's likely to pull back if it's not cracked. Unlike a metal car where if it gets dinged, it's gonna stay a dent. So these panels are also modular so that pieces can be removed separately. And the idea is that that would have been cheaper. However, someone did throw something at my car somewhere around here and it did crack. It was thrown fairly hard um, while I was driving on the street and we're gonna call it vandalism and they did have to replace this whole panel. But in order to do that, they did have to remove this portion as well. And that cost ended up being in excess of $3,000. So something you need to be aware of. Some people reported that the replacement of this back section is around $5,000. This is all glass, which is a cool look, very clean, easy to clean. One thing you wanna note about the car as far as insurance is concerned is that this car, as you may know, has a carbon fiber chassis. So this entire car is carbon fiber as far as the chassis is concerned. So most cars on the road, actually every car on the road <laughs> that is not a fancy $200,000 plus car will not have a carbon fiber chassis, apart from the i8. But exotic cars, uh, you, may be, you may consider that an exotic car, but for everyday cars, you're not gonna have a carbon fiber chassis. And so what does this mean for you? This means that if you do, if you are involved in a collision and there is necessary repair to the carbon fiber chassis that is going to be expensive because most auto body shops are not qualified or certified to be working on carbon fiber which means the cost will be extensive and so the chances of the car being declared totaled is higher okay because we know the this i3 or i3s in general are the best value used car on the market today i'll probably have a separate video about that but because the value of these cars once used drops so low and the cost of repairing it is so high, that gap between the current value and the cost to repair is, is so, so different that the insurance companies are likely to declare it totaled. So that's something you need to be aware of if you're buying it or if you already have one, just avoid accidents if you can. What you need to know about this front trunk or frunk is that it is not waterproof. 
I repeat, it is not waterproof. So do not put your laptop in here. Uh, these chargers to some degree are waterproof. You can charge your car in the snow, in the rain, and it's just fine. You just wanna make sure it's the other end, the three prong end is dry before you're gonna be plugging it into a wall socket of any sort. Underneath here, you're gonna have to remove the entire box, okay, to get to your battery, your 12 volt battery, which is going to be back there. I have a separate video about how to do that yourself. It is a full comprehensive video, um, step by step on exactly how you can do it as an owner. And it's not a see how I did it, and then skipping a bunch of steps. So I do have a separate video where you can do it. A lot of people have been using that. That's kind of their go-to for changing your 12 volt. And that needs to happen every three years-ish. This is your gas tank. And there will be times where you're gonna press the button on the inside of the car and it does not open. It's gonna be one of two reasons. One is your 12 volt battery is out and none of the electronics work. The second reason, which is more likely, is that it's just stuck. And in that case, there's an emergency pull cord, and that's what this green guy is. So you're gonna go ahead and take that cord out, and you're just gonna yank it gently, and then it's gonna disengage the mechanism that locks that, and then you'll be able to open it. Over the course of the introduction of the i3 from 2014 in the United States to currently 2021, there are three battery sizes. The first one is 60 amp hour, the 94 amp hour and 120 amp hour. The larger the battery, the heavier the car, the performance suffers a little bit, but you get better range. For the 2014 to 2016 and part of 2017 is going to be the 60 amp hour battery. And for that, the gas tank size is dumbed down by software, okay? Meaning this 2.4 gallon gas tank the car will only recognize 1.9 gallons of a 2.4 gallon size tank. And this is only applicable for the earlier models of the 60 amp hour battery. So why is that? So in the United States, for this car to be categorized as it is, the gas portion cannot give you more range than the electric portion. So what they did was they dumbed down the range of the gas tank by literally having the car software recognize the tank as smaller than it is. The physical size is 2.4 gallons, but the car only recognizes at 1.9. So what you can do is you can hack it or code it so that in the United States you can have your earlier 60 amp hour battery car recognize that as the full 2.4 gallons. Some of you may not be aware of what coding or hacking a car means, so I want to talk about it briefly. And it's nothing to be really concerned or scared about. So basically, cars in different countries need to have features turned on and off based on the laws of that country. You can imagine different countries have different laws, and so the car companies or manufacturers aren't going to necessarily omit certain features or add certain features that are legal or illegal in each particular country. So what they're going to do is they're going to turn those features off that are pre-existing in the car using software. And so back in the day, people would use laptops. You'd have to go to a shop or find someone who's very good at what they're doing and knows what they're doing. And they have a laptop with special software that enables them to turn on and off features. And back in those days, if you deleted the wrong line or you press delete at the wrong time, you could literally brick the car and it wouldn't work anymore. So nowadays you can actually buy an app and there are two apps and I'm gonna put them in the description or somewhere up there. And those apps are not cheap apps. Those are not $1 apps, those are about $35 apps, okay? And what that does is that allows you to turn on and off those features on your own, by yourself, and it's fairly easy. And you don't have to worry about the car really breaking because all you're really doing is turning features on or turning features off. And the other component you need to buy to, to have that work is going to be an OBD2 reader. And basically that's a device that costs about $17 or higher. And that plugs into a socket under the steering wheel and the footwell. You, you may have seen some mechanics use something of that sort, but basically you can buy that on your own with the app and you can turn on and off features. The gas tank in your i3 does require 91. Do not try to put 87 
or 89 octane in there to save a few dollars or a few dimes because <laughs> that tank is quite small. Just go for the 91 as they recommend. Uh, the reason I took that off is just to show you there's a little thing here where you can store this when you're pumping gas. Your Rex or gas generator is going to be under this mess. It's going to be under here. Okay. And so when your car runs out of electricity down to 6%, that will operate on its own. And the only difference between the performance of the car, as far as you're concerned as the driver, is that it is simply louder. There will not be any performance difference for the most part. So I want to talk a little bit about how the Rex really works. I'm going to get back on this tripod here. Our i3 has a gas generator, not a gas motor. Okay, so what that means is that the generator creates electricity. So it's no different than a generator that you would use for camping or for um, providing electricity um, portably somewhere. So what happens is you pour gas into the generator and the generator creates electricity. Your car, when it switches to gas, is actually not running on gas directly. It's still running on electricity, which is a good and bad thing. So the good thing is that there's no change in the performance because as you're running on pure electricity with your high voltage battery and it switches over to using the Rex, it's still running on electricity being generated by the Rex. So that's great because you're not going to feel any difference. The only no thing you're going to notice is there's going to be a loud rumbling sound in the back that you're not used to. And it's not super annoying. It's going to be probably as loud as any other car. However, um, you're probably used to it being pretty quiet and so that noise will be noticeable especially at stop signs or when the car isn't moving around. I do need to warn you about something regarding the Rex and there's nothing really to be concerned about but it's important to understand how it works so that you know how to use it. Okay so how the Rex works is as I mentioned earlier it creates electricity. So when you pour in gas and it's operating it's creating electricity at a certain rate so it's not going to make it super fast, it's not going to make electricity super slow, there's a certain rate at which it's generating electricity. While you're driving, there's also a variable rate at which you're using electricity. So if you're driving fast, or if you're driving up a hill, or you're struggling somehow through dirt or off-road, then it's going to use more electricity. If you're driving slower, or not slamming on the accelerator, then it's going to use less electricity. So we're going to be comp you have to be aware of comparing the rate at which the Rex is creating electricity and the rate at which you are demanding electricity. So the goal is that the rate at which the Rex is creating electricity is more than the demands you're putting on the battery or the electricity of the car. If the demands of the car based on how you're driving and your speed and the hills or whatnot is higher than the rate at which the Rex is able to create electricity, then you can you can expect that the electricity is going to drop lower and lower and lower and lower to a point where you're not running on electricity at all, and you you would indeed be running on gas. And I know that sounds weird, but if that happens, then your car supposedly will slow down to 40 miles an hour, like the scooter that the generator had has come from okay from BMW it's kind of a repurposed scooter generator or engine and so when you are running on the Rex you do not want to be running the car too hard too fast up hills for too long the Rex is really designed as a backup system to get you to the next gas station it's not something that you want to be using hardcore in an aggressive manner so why would BMW put a Rex in the car at all? Why not just put a larger battery? <laughs> so that's a good question. And that has to do with the efficiency. So when BMW designed this car, they're trying to make it as efficient as, as possible and as light as possible. So the weight has a lot to do with the performance of a car. You can imagine that an empty battery does not weigh any less than a full battery. So when you're driving in, like say, a gas car, 
the fuel or the oil will burn and you're actually driving a lighter and lighter car as you drive a gas car. But with electric cars, you're not. You're still hauling the weight of the battery. So if you have a bigger battery, you need to haul that weight before you'll even see any efficiency or increase in range at all. So in other words, the bigger the battery, the less efficient the electric vehicle becomes. And so the Rex actually weighs less as far as the number of miles you get versus the equivalent electric battery. So that's the only reason. Well, that's part of the reason. The reason, again, is because you're getting the same range but with lighter weight.